All right, my name is Blair Tintella. I'm an attorney. I live here in the Atlanta area. Uh, I practice, I have a general practice uh, based out in, of Atlanta. And here we're uh, today to talk about the San Bernardino attack, if you're all not aware, which most of you should be. Um, Saeed Farouk and Tashim Malik uh, killed 44 people and injured 22 others uh, in California um, last December. And that set off an internet uh, worldwide or a national debate about you know, security versus liberty. Uh, the FBI was trying to access their phone. So um, what I'm going to do is um, let the panelists introduce themselves quickly. If you have any questions throughout this panel, just come up to the center microphone here. Uh, or if you have a disability, uh, I'll walk out to you and hand you the microphone. Um, so with that, we'll just start with Mr. Bankston. Hi, uh, I'm Kevin Bankston. I'm a lawyer, please forgive me. Uh, I spent most of my career at the Electronic Frontier Foundation, but these days I run an uh, advocacy and policy shop in Washington, D.C. called the Open Technology Institute that's fighting for everyone's uh, right to have access to an internet that is open and secure. I am Drew Porter. I am not a lawyer. <laughs> so you don't have to hate me, I guess. Um, no, I, uh, my background deals with exploit development. I used to run a lab where the government would ask us to build tools for them and toys um, to get around all this red tape that lawyers you know, put against them. Uh, and now I run my own security firm. <coughs> My name is Amy Stepanovich. I am a lawyer. I feel like now I have to say that. Um, uh, I am the U.S. policy... Sorry. <laughs> Didn't mean to sue you. <laughs> um, I'm U.S. policy manager and global policy counsel at an organization called Access Now. We're a human rights organization. We work out of 10 locations all over the world um, trying to extend and defend the digital rights of users at risk. My name is TJ Myhill. I'm also a lawyer. You're going to hear that a lot today, I think. And uh, I'm a civil litigator who represents businesses, intellectual property disputes, uh, and, and other uh, other business matters, civil civil litigation generally. I'm uh, Kurt Opsahl. I'm the uh, Deputy Executive Director and General Counsel with the Electronic Frontier Foundation, uh, an organization uh, dedicated to defending your rights online who's been fighting for uh, the against uh, back doors and for strong encryption for about you know, 20 years. Oh, and uh, <laughs> My name is Jay Freeman, and I am the second not a lawyer. Um, most people online know me better as Sork. I run Cydia, the alternative to the App Store, on jailbroken iPhones. Um, I'm always involved after the hack uh, on these devices, but I work very closely with all of the uh, teams that do jailbreaking, such as Evaders, Pangu, the iPhone dev team, which is very cool. Um, and uh, so I, I have a lot of knowledge of how a lot of those exploits are put together, how they operate, and some of the internal complexities. I'd like to start off real quick just with some background about the San Bernardino. Uh, but before we do that, I had a personal question. Is there anyone here who, who is from the FBI? <laughs> NSA? Because we can make room on the panel for you today. If, if you're from the FBI, I'll buy you a beer. If you're from the I'll NSA, I'll buy you two. We'll accept, we'll accept the NSA. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll just hand it over to the panelists here. And start. Uh, just briefly, you know, describe the San Bernardino situation, what happens. Maybe some background with the history of the debate. Uh, all right, all right. So, well, so, some background to this. I think, actually, we have to go back through the mists of time to... Uh, <laughs> Uh, the first uh, encryption uh, wars uh, was in, in the 1990s, disputes uh, between uh, the, the FBI and the technology community that will seem remarkably similar to some of the discussion today, uh, over whether people should have access to strong encryption, um, and whether uh, the government should be able to have uh, a backdoor, a, a, a key. Um, and this came up in a, in a number of uh, forums. One of them that, uh, that my organization was involved in, uh, we represented a, uh, well then a graduate student, now he's a, he's a professor of, of cryptography, but uh, a graduate student who had written, uh, written a strong encryption program and uh, wanted to publish it open source on, uh, on the internet, uh, wanted to uh, make this available, but this came into conflict with uh, some export controls. 
that uh, uh, so there was the longest time there was a notion that uh, cryptography was uh, a tool of warfare, a munition that was regulated as, as such, uh, and that it had, while it had become commercialized and people were using uh, cryptography for a variety of applications, uh, it was still on the export control list, and uh, we uh, we thought this uh, uh, interfered with his uh, First Amendment rights. Uh, and uh, so took that to the court and established that uh, code was speech, that he had a First Amendment right to publish this code, and so he was able to uh, publish uh, the encryption program. And some of the, the collateral effects of that was that uh, uh, the export control regime that at that time was creating a very funny world. Uh, for those who are old enough to remember the early days of the web, there was a version of uh, Netscape Navigator, one of the early browsers, and there was the export version, the international version, and there was the domestic version, and the international version was uh, was crippled by, uh, due to these export controls, it couldn't have strong encryption, it could only use encryption that was relatively easy to attack. Uh, and this was a real barrier to the development of electronic commerce, so that you know, you may able to safely use your credit cards and communicate with you know, say Amazon and, and buy something, people felt more secure doing it with uh, a, a encryption program. Uh, that was the secured socket layer uh, that was added on as part of the program. Um, so uh, another proposal that was coming at that time, key escrow, where there was something called the clipper chip. Uh, the government wanted to uh, have people use this, trip, this chip to uh, encrypt things but that there would be a key uh, available to the government uh, for whatever it, uh, it asked. Um, and uh, it turned out that this was uh, actually terrible. The clipper chip was, was broken in a couple of ways. Uh, one way was that you could uh, encrypt something with the chip without giving the key to the government, and the other way was that you could decrypt things with it without having the government's key. So it was sort of an utter failure from a technology uh, point, of, point of view. Uh, and uh, uh, this uh, uh, helped uh, uh, make it so that the attempt to mandate it didn't go through. Even, even the government could see that uh, a terribly broken uh, key escrow wasn't a good idea. Uh, and so uh, that, that was the state of the world for a little while, uh, where uh, it seemed that uh, it was established that you could have strong encryption, that the government uh, at least had backed off on its uh, desire to mandate uh, backdoors being built into technology. So then we fast forward to uh, a number of years uh, into the, sort of the late 2000s, and something, uh, something happened that sort of changed the, the paradigm a little bit, is that encryption was not only becoming sort of widely available, but also widely deployed by default. So that it used to be that you know a few uh, crypto nerds would uh, encrypt their things with uh, uh, special programs like uh, PGP, stands for Pretty Good Privacy. It's an end-to-end -end encryption email program. Very hard to use. Very few people used it. Uh, but now it was becoming ubiquitous. So Apple, uh, without really even making a big deal about it, introduced end-to-end uh, -end encryption with iMessage. So if you sent a text message from an Apple phone to another Apple phone. It was end-to-end -end encrypted. You didn't have to do a thing about it. Uh, they started to introduce as well uh, disk encryption by default, so that uh, you had to, you know, put a passcode to unlock a phone. Otherwise, the uh, the information on there was um, uh, encrypted. And this was happening for now hundreds of billions of phones all around. And this uh, it reinvigorated the government's fear of uh, not being able to get uh, access uh, to these devices, not because the, like, the policy reasons sort of change, but the importance of it when it is available by default. Now, I would say actually having it available by default is actually a really good thing. This massively increases the security uh, of people's interactions online. Uh, because you have an encrypted phone, if somebody uh, uh, steals your phone, they can't easily get access to that, that data. Uh, your, your ability to uh, restrict it so it, uh, it won't boot up unless you have the passcode. It makes it so that someone's stealing a brick that actually has had a good effect on reducing the prevalence of uh, phone theft. Like these things really enhance our security, but it becomes a bit worrisome for, for the government. 
Uh, and so, um, some cases had started to come out where the government was trying to say that uh, the telephone uh, company providing the, the phones had to give them access to, to the data. And one of them was a, a case in uh, Brooklyn. Um, and uh, it went before a, a magistrate judge there. And, and Apple, uh, sorry, the, uh, the government was asserting that uh, it could uh, get an order to tell Apple to uh, give that information. Um, and uh, uh, the, the judge uh, said, wait a second, I'm not sure this really works. The government was using something called the All Writs Act, a law from the uh, 1700s, it's actually older than the Bill of Rights. Uh, it's been modified a few times since then, but it essentially says uh, we're giving the authority for courts to issue orders as necessary to do whatever else that they do. It's sort of an enabling provision. It wasn't specific to the situation, obviously. They had no idea of you know, mobile phones then. Uh, but uh, uh, the government said, well, it's broad enough to cover it. And the and judge said, wait a minute, I'm not so sure. Could you brief this for me? I want to really look at this deeply. Uh, and so, uh, and, and they also uh, asked Apple to brief it. Uh, my organization, along with some others, filed a, an amicus brief in that case, and the judge was like, "All right, thanks for your briefing. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll be thinking about it and get you back to it in order." Then, in the meantime, they went to uh, the court in uh, uh, San Bernardino uh, County, uh, outside of Los Angeles, the the site of the uh, terrible uh, uh, attacks uh, perpetrated uh, by a couple who uh, uh, had an iPhone. And uh, uh, that iPhone had been left in a car. Um, and uh, so when they were searching the car, they came across the, the, the phone that had been left there. It was actually a phone that was owned by the county, issued by the county, to them. So it wasn't their personal phone, it was a work, work phone for, um, well, we, uh, for, for the work purposes, I'm not sure exactly what they did with it, but I guess well, the government eventually found out. Um, anyway, uh, they decided this would be the, the test case. So several several months uh, later, after they found the phone, they said, okay, we need to get an order to get into it. They uh, presented that to the court um, in, uh, in secret. These are things that are, are done uh, without uh, anybody else uh, uh, participating in it, and asked for an order telling Apple to give them access to the phone, and in specific to disable its security features. Um, and the court issued the order the same day. Uh, the, the order was the proposed order written by the government. It actually was a very lengthy and, and went into sort of great detail. Uh, and uh, it seems, uh, uh, you know, it'd be a, a lot for someone to review and really understand to issue it the same day. So at least there's a possibility that the judge uh, uh, more or less uh, said, oh, uh, seems good to me, I'll just sign this. Uh, but then Apple was uh, protested, said that this wasn't uh, a valid uh, order, uh, and for some good reasons. Uh, and this then uh, became that the order was unsealed and Apple was challenging it in the court. Uh, and so uh, a lot of people were very interested both in the, uh, the sort of the policies behind this, the legal issues. So uh, we filed amicus brief. I think there were 40 amicus briefs that were filed in the case, uh, mostly on the side of uh, the government uh, should not be able to compel Apple to disable its security features, a few on the side saying uh, that uh, Apple should, uh, and then that case wa was pending. And then, remember about the Brooklyn case? Well. That judge noticed there was a big controversy going on and, and may have accelerated the decision because he came out with his decision while this was pending and said no, uh, that the government didn't have the authority under the All Writs Act uh, to do so. So now the, the government had a case against them in, uh, in Brooklyn and then the, uh, the, the order that had been signed but now was being challenged out in San Bernardino. And then the day before the hearing, where they were going to discuss whether the order should be modified or rescinded or uh, endorsed, uh, as, as uh, a number of us uh, were actually about to get on planes to fly down there and, and go to the hearing, in fact some of my friends were already there, uh, the government had, uh, announced that, hey, wait a minute, uh, 
we have been in contact with some uh, security companies or security researchers who have uh, a way to get into the phone without Apple's assistance. So let's postpone the hearing. And a couple of days later, they said, yes, we were able to get on the phone. So we're going to call the whole thing off. And so we never actually got to the decision. Why does this all matter? I mean, why do we care if Apple releases our information or does what the government wants to do? I mean, first of all, what did the government want Apple to do? And why does it matter? I mean, if we have nothing to hide, why not just hand over everything and not worry about it? If you have nothing to hide, why not give the police the key to your front door? And the, the, the point is we have constitutional rights and, and privacy rights for a reason. And the encryption is part of that privacy. Now let's start from the fact that the All Writs Act is actually a fairly important element of church prudence. Okay? It's, it's something that we actually do need. It's not, you know, it, it came up in a, in a context here that's sort of out of the ordinary, but generally it comes in in the context of things like if, if I have court authority to open this safe deposit box, then the court can order a locksmith to come and open that safe deposit box for me. If I have court authority to uh, review computer files, the court can order someone to bring me the computer and let me review it or, or, or order me access to the computer. Uh, there are things that the court has the right to order people to do in order to allow its other orders judicially processed to be enforced. So it is something that's a very necessary element, otherwise we'd have a bunch of paper orders with no ability to actually do what the court has told us to do. But that doesn't necessarily mean that that what the court was telling Apple to do in this case is the same thing as bringing in the locksmith, right? There's a lock here and there's a locksmith who can open it. And he's got a bag of tools and it's the same bag of tools he's had since the 1700s and he'll just go and fiddle with it and it's open, right? He didn't have to create anything new. He didn't have to make anything that didn't exist. And most importantly, he didn't have to make anything that would cripple his own product. And that's the issue here. What, what they were asking Apple to do was to create a back door that would certainly only exist in Apple and be destroyed immediately after, and the government would never ask them to use it again. But it was, it was, hey, why don't you develop something that doesn't now exist and cannot now be done on technology in your possession and create a key, create a backdoor, figure out a way to break your own encryption, and then do that. And then that exists. Right? And that's not the same thing as opening a door or finding a key that already exists somewhere or hiring a locksmith to use a skill that we already have. That's asking a company to do something that creates a crippling aspect of its own product. And I think that's something that's very, very different from what the All Writs Act normally has us do. So when um, Kurt was talking about the Clipper chip before, one of the technologists who actually showed all the vulnerabilities in the Clipper chip was Matt Blaze. And Matt likes to say that security is really, really hard. And that technologists, uh, cryptographers are really bad at their jobs. And by that he doesn't mean that he should be, you know, penalized. It means that it's really hard to create a product that doesn't have a vulnerability or doesn't have something that you can exploit to break into that product. And companies are constantly fighting this battle to try to stay half a step ahead of the people who are trying to break into their products to get all to all of your information for whatever bad purpose that they want to use it for, whether they want your credit card or your emails or to get to Hillary Clinton's emails or whatever they're looking for, striving to stay just that one piece ahead. And why is this important to a human rights organization? Um, there's actually a report written by David Kay, he's the UN Special Rapporteur for Freedom of Expression, that analyzed encryption and analyzed an anonymity supporting tools on the internet and found that you actually, especially like in the United States, but in countries like Kazakhstan and China and places where it's illegal to be LGBT or to criticize the government, you need to have access to these tools in order to be able to express, uh, to exercise your freedom of expression, to exercise your right to privacy, that there is, you do not necessarily have a human right to encryption, but it is absolutely necessary to be able to exercise your human rights. And so when you create a iPhone with a back door, or you create, you have sitting in a database somewhere an operating system that allows you to circumvent the security controls that lead to Apple's encryption, um, that is an open invitation 
for people to try to either get to that or to try to people to inviting people to break into that back door or whatever extra complication the developers had to go through in order to design that back door. So now they're not only striving to build a secure product, they're trying to striving to build a secure product that fails sometimes, but only when the government wants it to fail which is like, if you think it's hard to begin with, you're adding this level of complication that's near impossible, and you can't do that. And so you're actually allowing these different pieces that will break into your information, um, totally undermine, not only, I mean, you, you said, um, you started with like, why do I, why me, why do I care? Do I have nothing to hide? Because it's not just us, and that's actually really, really selfish framing that people who work in privacy hear a lot. Um, your tools are used by everybody. The Apple iPhone is used by everybody around the world. Um, you don't get a different tool if you buy an iPhone in Kazakhstan or New York or California, as much as the government would like that. And so it's it's a really it's a creating a marketplace for security or insecurity, depending on which one you support. I wanted to build on a point here, uh, a few of them. Um, first off, who, who, who watches uh, last week tonight with John Oliver? Anyone in the room? Yes. He did a fabulous bit on this admittedly complex and difficult issue that ended with a parody Apple commercial um, that shows their security engineers just frantically doing everything they can to stay ahead of the attackers because that is what security is, is these people trying to find and plug the, their own holes before the bad guys do. And at some point they're like, so hey, great, you're doing a great job now, could you also make it breakable for just the law enforcement when they come? And they're like, are you freaking kidding? We're, we're engineers, we're not effing wizards. And, <laughs> and yeah, I mean, that's why people joke that, uh, who are concerned about the government's um, pressure for back doors here, we, we jokingly talk about the government wants a golden key, some sort of back door that only the good guys can use. But the distinction between lawful access, lawfully authorized with a warrant for lawful purposes, and illegal access, not with those things, is a legal distinction, not a technical one. You can't build a back door that's gonna check for your warrant or make sure you're a good guy. Um, and that's why, you know, uh, 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 Blair mentioned, um, you know, the discussion of security versus liberty. We often hear this framing. It's a question of security versus liberty or security versus privacy. And, and often you'll hear the people who are worried about encryption framing it that way, because usually if it's security versus anything and we're afraid, Security will win, but it's also not an accurate framing because this is really about security versus security because every technical expert who's talked about this since the 90s, we've been here before, has said that if you actually want strong encryption, whether we're talking about encrypting your iPhone or whether we're talking about end-to-end -end encryption of your iMessages or your now WhatsApp messages or whatever, um, there is not a way to build uh, uh, a, a strongly secure key escrow system uh, uh, that, that can't be compromised, and it's impossible to build one where you can verify whether it's been compromised. And so if we create this kind of system, one, we open ourselves to abuse by people acting under color of law, but who shouldn't be using it. Uh, we open ourselves to, well, gee, China and Russia and every other high, you know, uh, every other persistent attacker is going to target those systems. Um, we've seen this before when like, the Chinese broke into Microsoft and Google systems and went straight for their lawful surveillance stuff so that they could see who the US government was spying on. Um, and uh, as Amy mentioned, uh, uh, you know, the more complex you make the product trying to do this, the more bugs you're gonna create that could be <coughs> exploited. Um, so that's the overall concern. And we, you know, I, I, anyway, I'll speak for myself, like, this is going to cause trouble for law enforcement in some cases. I do not deny that. It's also going to help them in an enormous number of cases where it prevents crimes. But it is going to hinder them in some investigations. And uh, I think there are a number of reasons not to be totally concerned about that. In fact, there was a great report from some experts at the uh, Berkman Center at Harvard, uh, literally entitled, Don't Panic. Um, you know, don't worry, the FBI is not really going dark. And the thrust of their argument was, yes, there is some stuff you're not going to be able to access. But compare that to all of the reams of data 
that you can access. Like all those logs about our emails and IM, our IMs and our locations and all those pictures and social network stuff, stuff that you never had 10, 20 years ago. Um, there's gonna be stuff you can't get, but we are, even so, we are in the midst of a golden age of surveillance, and we're not moving toward a world where everything is encrypted. There's always gonna be a lot of stuff out there for them to get their hooks into uh, when trying to make a case. So, um, a few thoughts. Let me, so, just, let me just follow up on that real quick, because one of the things that both, that both Amy and Kevin have said is that, well, but it's okay if we can find something that only the good guys, I know you can say that, but there. That, that what the government wants is something that only the good guys can use, but it's okay because only the good guys will use it. We want that golden ticket that's just for the good guys. Well, yeah, if you've seen me on previous panels, you know I'm a bit of a cynic, but I don't necessarily think that even the good guys having unlimited access is necessarily good, because think of what Drew said at the very, very beginning of this, which is, I'm going to make a toy for the government so they can avoid all that annoying red tape that lawyers throw at them, which is called the fucking Constitution. <laughs> <laughs> Just to know, I don't build toys for the government anymore. So, <laughs> thank you. So, so the, the, the problem you have is even if you give the good guys the golden key and they're only going to use it against the bad guys, until they don't. Until they decide it's easier to just say, oh, I don't really need a court order anymore because I've already got the key. And I'll just look at what you're doing and I'll find out if you're a bad guy. That's the problem with even the good guy having the golden key. Yeah, and, th and that's correct. I mean, that's part of the reason why I got out building uh, toys for the government, as we'll put it. Uh, it's because the first group that you build this tool or toy, or whatever you want to call it, exploit, whatever, um, for may not abuse it, but it's a group that hears about that after that that would be like Holy crap. We can do this to monitor everyone. Why are we not doing this? And then you know everyone's like yeah, we should totally just monitor everyone um, So so when you build these tools, it's usually the first use is not to be abused against you know every US citizen It's the second use that where it gets abused, right? Uh, and golden keys. I mean, that worked out well for Microsoft, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, no. Uh, also, who here, if, if Apple said, we have a backdoor that we have to put in our product uh, because of a government mandate, who here would willingly buy an Apple product still? Wow. Oh, okay. There are like two Mac fanboys that I know that are here. And I knew, I knew one of them right here was going to raise his hand. Uh, but we got it's, another. It's another still person. white. It's still white, right? Yeah. No, I mean, it, has, it has. No, no, it's silver. Silver is a new oh, color, right? Oh, 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 sorry. Yeah. Um, no, rose gold. gold. Oh, rose gold. Oh, sorry, I'm not hip. I don't really do the whole Apple thing. Um, but yeah, so I mean, most people would not. Um, buy a product where they knew they had backdoors in it, besides Windows. Um, people still seem to buy that. Uh, <laughs> um, but really, I mean, if, if Apple had to come out and be like, yeah, we have to place a backdoor in here for the government, if you have nothing to hide, you have nothing to fear type of you know, slogan that they'd come up with, um, I, would, I would avoid them more than I do already, like the play. Um, and I don't avoid them because they're insecure. Um, it's a different reason. Uh, but yeah, uh, I mean, these, you cannot build a secure product that has a backdoor in it, right? You can no longer honestly say your product is secure if you have to put a backdoor in it. Uh, you're just lying to your consumers, uh, you're lying to yourself, and, uh, you know, your engineers probably won't use that product either. Um, if, if Apple had to do that, the Apple engineers would have an iPhone that is given to uh, them by the company as an employee phone. And then they'd probably have Android uh, running, you know, on their personal phone. Uh, but yeah, no, I mean, it's a very good point. Is that these tools will get abused for sure? So I, I want to provide a very different kind of context. Uh, so what essentially a ever so slightly technical context. But I'm going to try to make it so that it's a, it's not highly technical or anything. So, um, but as far as like what's actually happening here. So the iPhone stores files, it stores all of your data, and all of that data is encrypted. It's encrypted what we call at rest. So the idea is with the device is off, all that data is encrypted, but when you're using it, you have to be able to see all that data. You have to be able to go into the messages app and, and be able to read all of your messages. <coughs> that data is encrypted with a key, and that key is generated using uh, two things, really. Um, it's generated using a key that is, on the, that is burned into the phone, which is unique to every single phone, 
which is generated at the time the phone is manufactured, and which um, is generated by a process that would be very difficult for Apple to maintain a copy of it anyway, and Apple tells us that they don't, and you can kind of audit their manufacturing as something, and you can see that they don't do that. And the other thing is it's generated using your passcode. And so your passcode is often a four-digit code or a six-digit code. Um, and sometimes you can turn on the feature to let you use an alphanumeric code. And this code is then encrypted using the key that's on the phone in order to get another block of data, which is the key that is used in order to encrypt um, the things into the files. And, that's, and so this, that specific process there is, is maybe not that important to understand fully, but it's, it's these two parts come together. And the reason why I bring this context up is, is that um, what the FBI was asking to be able to do is to be able to brute force the pin code. So if you sat down long enough and you sat and you, and you were able to type on it, type into the phone, you can type through all 10,000 four-digit pin codes and eventually find the one that would work. Except that would take a long time because you've got to sit around and manipulate the screen, the touch screen, your finger. And the phone has a feature where if you, um, which, which was, my understanding was on on this device, um, if you try more than 10 pin codes, it just deletes all the data on the phone. And so your chance is now really low that you're actually going to guess the right pin code. Now, that feature is implemented. The feature of how many times have you tried, let's destroy all the data, is implemented in software on the phone. So there's just the, 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 the same um, screen where you type in your, your pin code is the feature that was counting that number from 0 to 10. Until recently. Now, so I say until recently. On, this, on the device in question, my understanding is, is that it was implemented in software. It was implemented in software up until the iPhone 5S. Now, that software is software that Apple controls on the phone. And it's software that we have been, we as in the jailbreak community, often try to find mistakes in, bypass, and attack. And so to me, the, a really interesting thing is, uh, has occurred here, which is that as, as much as I don't want the FBI to, to do the thing that they were doing, I, I feel like we, we oftentimes end up putting Apple on a pedestal. Of, of what they've done, and I'm, and I'm going to make a point about what, what they've done that I think is almost complicit already. So, we have tools. I, I work with somebody named Jonathan Jajerski occasionally. He's um, in the iPhone dev team. He's one of the original um, people who do iPhone hacking. Um, and he, he does iPhone forensics, and he and MSFT guy have, have tools which allow you to boot up a phone um, if you have an exploit, if you have a bug, if you have a mistake that Apple has made, if you have one of our jailbreaks that works at the, at the, when the phone first boots, it allows you to boot up the phone into it's kind of a single user mode, the same thing if you were to boot up a Mac into recovery mode or a Windows computer into recovery mode. And you're able to control all the software that runs on it. We just give you direct terminal access to the phone. And they have tools which will do the brute forcing of the pin code. And in fact, if you have an iPhone 4, if you have one right now in your hand in the audience, you might have an old phone. Um, and I were to have more than 10 minutes access to it, I could brute force your pin code. Now, that, that, that ability is something, as I said, requires an exploit, requires a jailbreak, requires a bug. Or it requires Apple's key that allows you to make software that runs on the phone. And so, this, so when I hear these comments oftentimes about Apple not building backdoors for the government, I would like to point out that Apple has a backdoor. They have a golden key. They have something that only the good guys have access to, and it's the key that Apple currently has that gives them access to your phone. The, and and that, 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 that is what the FBI was asking Apple to use, and I don't think the FBI should be able to ask Apple to use that. I, I, I agree with all of the arguments that have been made by DFF that Apple shouldn't be forced to do work in order to actually you know, utilize this backdoor in order to do things. I, I wish Apple hadn't made that backdoor. And so on newer versions of the phone, there's another, there's another chip. It's, it's the secure execution processor. And this chip is, is separate from the normal application software. And this chip counts the number of times that the pin code is used. And if it gets to 10, it is in charge of destroying everything. And that is something that is separate from all the software updates that Apple provides. Except as far as we understand, it is not. If you are Apple, you are still able to upgrade the software on the secure execution processor without having the pin code of the original device. So I would like to see Apple actually essentially build a device that doesn't have these backdoors, that doesn't have the ability to let users, um, to let, let people with that key, to let uh, anyone who has their backdoor into the device. And, and I think that's always a semantic shift that I think, I think is needed here is, is because other, otherwise we're in a situation where we're arguing for encryption that protects people, encryption without backdoors, but we're arguing for encryption that has backdoors already. It's just we, we're arguing about who has the backdoor, who's in control of it which is not the same thing to be clear for PGP. So like in the case with like clipper chips and all that stuff, you were generating keys, you were using software, it's not like um, the, the, the encryption that you were using, there was no one else who was sitting around with the backdoor. I 
that's very helpful context. I really want to bounce off of that because it enables an additional point around this signing key issue, actually a couple of different points. Um, one, the government will, people who are arguing for backdoors will say, hey, if Apple has a key like this such that they can sign software such that the phone accepts it as real, well, then gee, hey, that's a backdoor, that's cool. You, you see, you, it's not impossible, you can do backdoors. But it's worth saying that, you know, that key is the definition of the family jewels for Apple, and it is the most secure thing that they have, and it's handled very, very carefully, and it doesn't ever have to, there's not a whole lot of transactions that it needs to approve. I mean, uh, there's a fairly regular number of them, but then you imagine, like, what would the system look like where the government is actually interfacing with Apple on a regular basis? Like, say, at the scale that, say, you know, they ask email companies for your email or ask phone companies for your phone records, which is thousands of times a year, many thousands of times a year, they'll have some sort of online portal, it'll be a much more complex system, that would be much harder to secure than simply the single signing key that they use to sign their updates. Um, but that's not the main point I wanted to make. The main point I wanted to make is you'll often hear the argument, well, this case was just about this phone. It's just this phone. Why won't you help us with just this phone? As several others have noted, obviously it wasn't just this phone. That would have been, one, creating a tool that law enforcement would expect to be able to use in the future. It's creating a tool that other countries would expect Apple to use on its behalf, on their behalf uh, in the future. Um, it creates a legal precedent to make them or other companies do it. And that's where the real worry comes in about this signing key thing. If under the All Writs Act, the government can go to a provider and say, we have some malware you want to, we want you to plant on a consumer's device, which is this, this is what essentially this was, um, and we want you to sign it and verify it as a legitimate update, that doesn't just endanger the phones that they've seized. That's something, they could go to any software vendor of any of the things on your phone or laptop and say, hey, next time you ship a security update or some other kind of update, we want to make you install this malware for us instead. It would completely undermine the security ecosystem that actually is supposed to try and keep you secure and would turn it to the ends of surveillance, which, amongst other things, would probably prompt a lot of people to stop using it, which would make them much less secure, which impacts your security, because often you're being attacked through other people's compromised machines. And so, so we weren't just talking about just one phone. We weren't even just talking about iPhones, and we weren't even just talking about Apple. We're talking about every, every hardware and software provider that could potentially shoot malware at you. And that's why this precedent mattered. But we never got the precedent, but neither did they. So. I'd like to encourage people, if they have questions, just to come up to the center. Um, there's a microphone right in the center there if people want to ask a question. Um, I'd like to ask one quick question real quick, though. Okay. <laughs> uh, first, though, is does it matter that the phone got broken into by information from some other hacker. And is the government required to disclose this? Can they just hold on to that secret and use it against Apple? Uh, well, so yeah, as, as we understand it, uh, the government uh, purchased a, uh, an exploit to get onto the phone. Um, they, the government also has what's called the vulnerabilities equities process where uh, it is supposed to uh, weigh the pros and cons of uh, disclosing a vulnerability to the manufacturer so it can be patched or whether they should hold on to it uh, and use it for uh, their, their governmental aims. However, because they purchased the exploit and not the vulnerability, uh, they did not engage in the vulnerabilities equities process with this one. They, or at least their, their, their story is that they don't have the vulnerability, they just have a black box they attach the phone to and then the phone was unlocked and who knows how it works so that they couldn't disclose it to Apple. Now Apple, uh, as you might imagine, is, is a little bit upset that they uh, have not been told about this uh, vulnerability. I'm sure many an Apple uh, uh, engineers, ours, are uh, been trying to figure out what it might have been uh, and try to fix it uh, anyway. But uh, th that process was, was not engaged in here because they bought the more limited black box exploit. <laughs> My, my thoughts may be more thoughts and comments rather than a question. Um, <coughs> looking at me, you probably know that I do not know one twit about any of 
that. I mean, I get what you're saying, but to me, your arguments are very, you know, educational, intellectual, fine and dandy. My understanding at the time was that the government wanted to know if there were any other plans in the works for some other kind of terrorist event. And I just, you know, I'm not for or against them. encryption. I'm probably more for it. However, if my child was killed or murdered by a terrorist and that information was on that phone, I'd be pretty damn upset. That's insane. Any, any counter arguments? Drew, I expected you to have some. You know, Pro-government stands <laughs> Yeah, I'm uh, not very pro-government. Uh, I'm pro, I guess, money. Um, <laughs> uh, no, I mean, you would definitely have every right to be angry uh, and be frustrated. And, and that, that particular element uh, in, in your life experience would definitely uh, assist you in having a particular mindset, right? Um, the problem is, is this. Um, it would be great if we could have that tool um, and it's just used against terrorists, right? Um, it would be great if uh, some of my methodologies were also uh, only used against terrorists at one time. Um, but, but that's not the case. As I said, those tools get abused, not by the original group, right? So uh, the group you sell it to, um, they do what they need to do and they have the purpose. And the purpose is to thwart other terrorist attacks, which is a very noble purpose. Um, the second group that gets hold of it, uh, it's no longer the FBI, right? Now let's say it's the ATF or you know some other group like that. Um, uh, their purpose is, uh, and the ATF isn't really good at running a whole bunch of Operations, if you ever heard of like Fast and Furious. Um, but and they do a lot of things right, just to let you know. But that, I mean, they do have some blenders. And that's the, the point that um, this, the, this type of thing would, uh, where if they were having, like Apple was having to develop this tool for them, uh, would make it so that the government, not the original group, or maybe the original group, but definitely another group. Uh, would most likely abuse that, um, which could put more people in danger. Uh, one good example, um, which is one that a lot of technical people fear, is uh, if you have XYZ tool set that allows you to see people's phones, um, someone that is in law enforcement that has an ex-wife that is angry at them, um, or an ex-husband that is angry at them, um, they can you know, get someone to get that person's phone and then view all the text messages, see who they're texting, other things like that, and start targeting people in that person's life because they're angry at them, right? Yeah. Um, but again, you would definitely have uh, the right to be angry uh, and to want, the, you would want the government to have that capability. Uh, unfortunately, it puts a lot of other people at risk, and, and that's a hard answer to say. Um, because it's just like, are you for people killing people then? It's like, no, of course not. Um, but I believe that there are more damages that could be done uh, if a company was told you have to put this capability in there, or if you already have it in there, you have to give us the capability to use it on, you know, unlimited. I wanted to, I wanted to add it because this is, this is the question, like this is the concern. Um, and, and, you know, my message is, even if you aren't worried about government abuse, even if you don't care about privacy as an abstract thing, um, people are going to die if we don't have strong encryption, too. Um, you know, people fighting for their human rights in repressive regimes are going to be tortured and killed based on things that were found on their phone. People will be shot on the street so their phone can be stolen. The thefts that will not occur if all of our phones are decrypted are encrypted by default. Um, untold many more thousands of people will have their lives ruined by identity theft. Companies will have their businesses ruined by corporate espionage. There are direct costs there as well. And I'm not saying that that calculus is easy or that it's, or, or certainly that it's easy to do it in a bloodless, cold, and rational manner. 
But I, I do think if you step back and you look at the pros and the cons of the different approaches, and this brings up another issue, which is, which we haven't hit on yet, which is trying to do these mandates is not going to stop terrorists from using encryption, especially if we're talking about the end-to-end -end messaging um, that, that many are worried about. When, you know, we, we put out a little paper about the nine end-to-end -end messaging applications nominally um, recommended by ISIS as secure. Eight of those nine are either offered from vendors outside of the United States, so nothing we do here will matter, or they're based on open source software that anyone can build on or use. And so even if we passed a mandate that required US companies to not have these technologies, uh, the bad guys would get them as well. Our tech industry would lose billions, um, and we wouldn't be much safer, but in many ways we'd be less safe. So that's, that's the sort of the calculus and where, just where I'm a, few, a few facts about the FBI case that I think are particularly interesting in this example. So each of the two perpetrators had their own personal phone, which they destroyed before the attacks happened. Um, they basically took a hammer to them. So presumably the sensitive information the FBI would want to get is on one of the two phones they destroyed and not the phone that they left sitting in the car. In addition, the FBI actually potentially could have had all of the information they possibly wanted had they gone to Apple first, because there's a possibility the phone had been backing up to the iCloud, and had they connected it to a known Wi-Fi, it would have backed up to the iCloud and all of that information would have been available. And the FBI messed up. They messed up big in a way that stopped that from being able to happen and necessitated the step. So honestly, if you look at their steps, they should have been smarter to begin with, and they should be smarter in all of these investigations and take the, the sensical steps that don't require making everybody who has an iPhone a little bit more at risk. Um, and the third point, I think, is the fear that they really wanted you to feel about this phone. I believe the words were dormant cyber pathogen about what was going to be sitting on this phone. That's what they told the court was on this iPhone. Um, and like I said, in all, in all circumstances, there was nothing on this phone. In fact, at the end of the day, the FBI was like, no, we really got useful evidence out of this phone. What we found out is there's no evidence on this phone. <laughs> and that is a common thing for the FBI to say. They find that when they find nothing, that that's helpful because they can say they found nothing. Um, I'd like to uh, move to the questions here. We have a bunch of people lined up, so we can try and get through them a little bit. So uh, I remember when this basically hit the news, uh, it was Basically, the FBI's position was markedly unpopular. I found very little stuff that was like, oh yeah, they, they should totally just move forward with this process. And despite that, they continued to push and continued to push, and all of Silicon Valley like pushed back. And then right when the FBI gets pushed into a corner, where it looks like the next day, their entire efforts are going to be squandered, within one week, they have all the information they needed. So they basically went through this whole negative PR campaign, and they, it, I kind of got the impression that they knew that there were other avenues to obtain this data that they could be going through. So was this something they did to try to establish legal precedent? Is this something that they did to try to basically see if they could break Silicon Valley and start this process where they would gain access to this data? Let's more go value? down the panel, yes or no. Do you believe Apple when they say they didn't have genuine access to the phone before creating this whole debacle? Okay. Do I believe the FBI okay. had the ability to get the information or they genuinely didn't? I'll lean towards no. But I, I, I think that they did an access. But I think that they, there is a market for uh, exploits on the iPhone. That market existed for a long time. Uh, I think the, the, you know, the going rate is somewhere around a million dollars for a, uh, uh, a hack on a fully patched uh, iPhone. Uh, I don't know, and that is the rumor of what they, they paid for this. Um, so I, I don't know if they had it before, but the market for it existed. <laughs> yeah, I think that's the answer. I think when, when they went to court the first time and said, hey, let's get into it, they thought that was the way to do it. Did they have other access? Potentially. But what they wanted was just the court to say, open this up, make Apple open this up for me. Um, after Apple said no, and it looked like they weren't going to get a yes from the court, they went and found doorway number two. Yeah, a plus one to Kurt, but I also, one of the elements to the All Writs Act is that they have to say they cannot get this through any other means, and I think the fact that they've went through this process blows that argument out of the water the next time they try to do this. 
Yeah, um, I, I think it was um, trying to establish case precedents for this because uh, the FBI uh, definitely knows that there's lab groups out there ready to sell them their uh, you know research. So yeah, it definitely was to set up case precedent, case precedent in my mind of why they're going through that. And then bad PR, I mean, it's like bad PR for the IRS. <laughs> like, they're the government, they don't care. <laughs> but you still pay them. <laughs> if I can get case precedent, then I can get it for free, so it's better than a million dollars. Exactly, and that's the point. Next question. Well, I'm also an attorney. Uh, in the course of education, I've come done a lot of research on both the Fourth Amendment People and keeping on top of the jurisprudence, and also to kind of have a working knowledge of encrypted technology. So, a question that's been really bugging me is in terms of protecting personal information uh, from the government, both presently and going forward, is there better hope, you know, in the lawyers and the courts, you know, and hoping the government follows the rules? Or are we counting on companies like Apple and their software engineers to actually create products that, and not give the government duck back doors, actually create secure products versus hoping the government? is limited by a constitution and rules like that. Why are you relying on the government or Apple to keep you secure? I'm just asking the uh, you know, That's my answer back. I mean, honestly, I mean, the, the, the truth is neither one of them has your best interest at, at, at heart. And that's, and, and that's the, the truth. Um, you know, Apple has a commercial interest in you, but they already have a backdoor. The government wants to keep you secure in whatever it defines that as today. But at the end of the day, your privacy, your security, your personal you has got to be protected by you and and that's and, and that's the only person who has your interest but I'm going to actually disagree here in the sense of if security depends on everybody being individually responsible and making really good decisions about how they're handling their information security well we're gonna have the situation we have now which is most of you are horribly insecure and that's not a knock on you guys um, it's a knock to some extent on the products and I think you spotted an important trend, which is especially post Snowden, uh, the company saw that the government was treating them as an adversary. So they started treating the government as an adversary. And that's where a lot of the encryption since then was prompted by. You know, we've seen a lot of the companies, especially um, not the encryption that the government is worried about at the law enforcement level, but at the intelligence level, um, turning on HTTPS, um, turning on encryption for when you are talking to their servers. Um, has has is has been their main response to a lot of the MSA revelations about the MSA tapping on the wire, and so from my perspective, as a non-technologist, as a consumer, um, I want products that are built that are secure against the government and ideally against the vendor itself. And and so to, to echo those points, um, but I think expecting everybody to be a security expert for themselves, like I think that's a really hard model to sustain. Really where my, that's really where my, my concern is coming from. You know, if I didn't take the work to actually know how to be private or gain security, it's just, I wouldn't. I wouldn't but know. That's why default security is so important and why we're fighting so hard to ensure that they can set those defaults strong rather than have the government say they can't. Next question. Let me just, while you're getting the next question, let me just respond, really quickly respond to that. I'm not suggesting that we all go out and learn how to be, you know, cryptographers and encrypt our own stuff. I'm saying, know what you're buying, know what you're getting, know where the security is, know where the security is, and then understand what your security is. Did anybody actually read the thing they clicked on that said, I agree to the terms and conditions? No. No. Oh, look at that. But you know, the truth is, most of us don't, and most of them are terrible. And, and most of it says, hey, I'm going to mine every bit of data you have and sell it to whoever I want. And we click it anyway because we really want to play that game. So, you know, don't, don't, don't be stupid with your privacy. It's not the same thing as have to go learn your own crypto. Whatever. I guess this is just, though, sorry. <laughs> I guess this is following up with the last question, but I'm a libertarian, so I'm really into freedom and liberty and privacy and when I see a panel like you guys I get really excited and I want to get involved but I'm a mere mortal so like I, I'm not as intelligent as you guys and I just want to know what I can do as a mere mortal to get involved and to uh, help the cause yeah uh, do you uh, uh, do you code in any languages anything like that HTML <laughs> HTML all right um, yeah so there's a few things that you can do. Um, you can, uh, one, uh, start looking up 
the technologies which uh, are recommended by people, um, security folks, stuff like that. Uh, EFF has some great uh, recommendations on technologies on how to become more secure, right? Replace your text messaging app with you know something like Signal, um, stuff like that. Um, and then if you want to get really, really involved, um, there's two routes you can go. Uh, one, you, come, you can become really, really smart and become a lawyer like these people, <laughs> or you can take the path which is, doesn't require you to be really, really smart, and you can start learning coding, right? So you can take our path. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, and start contributing to these open source programs um, and, and start, you know, um, verifying their claims and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, the, the first part is do a whole bunch of research, uh, spread the word from the good research that you're able to do, um, and then the, the next step is what path do you want to take? Do you want to take the true technology path or, or do you want to take the policy path or maybe you want to take a hybrid of both? Um, and let me just uh, add, there's one to Go talk about Steve. Uh, well, so uh, there's also going to be an activist, uh, like talk to or send messages to your representatives uh, about this issue. Uh, there's a website called savecrypto.org, which is a petition. Uh, it actually was submitted to uh, Obama 312 days ago with no uh, substantive uh, uh, response, but asking uh, the president to uh, stand up for, for strong crypto and you know, getting some more signatures on there does add uh, incrementally to, to the pressure. Uh, uh, my organization uh, has uh, an action center, we call it, act.eff.org. Uh, there's a variety of campaigns that are ongoing at any, any given time for uh, reaching out to representatives, signing petitions, tweeting at your elected representatives, and so on. So you can take action that way. So I'm going to echo, please, please, please speak to your local, state, federal representatives. I cannot overemphasize how much harm even engaging this conversation is done internationally. China now bans end-to-end -end encryption. Kazakhstan basically has implemented the clipper chip. Um, the EU wants to ban end-to-end -end encryption and they're working toward that. And actually, remember all of you who raised your hand that said you wouldn't buy a backdoor iPhone at the beginning? Um, the UK is about to imminently pass a law that will allow them to go to providers and put that malware into your system updates and inject it right into your phone, which means the next system update after this law passes that you have on your iPhone could contain a UK backdoor, and they could force them to do that. Um, the president really we desperately need him to stand up and to say that he supports strong encryption, savecrypto.org, securetheinternet.org, both great activist websites to use as resources if you want to talk to your representatives, and it is endlessly important that you engage there. It's important here as well. So go to EFF.org, go to accessnow.org, sign up for their mailing lists. I don't have an activist uh, operation in my shop, but they do, and they can tell you when threats are coming because threats are coming. The FBI Director Comey has been very clear. He's gonna bring this fight again next year, and whether, whether it's a, a Clinton administration or a Trump administration, um, it's only going to be, or, <laughs> He, he might help us on this, um, uh, but um, it's going to be an even harder fight for us next year. Um, and so please sign up for these guys' mailing lists so that they can tell you when the Hill needs to hear from All right, we have time for one more Thank question, you. one more quick question, and then remember the panelists will be here. You can come up and ask them questions. First off, I'm a socialist. I'm kind of the opposite of y'all, but I don't, believe that, <laughs> I don't believe that the government necessarily has the best interest in the heart of people because I don't believe there's such a thing as a government. There's people that work in the government, and just as Mr. TJ said, there are people with great intentions and there are people with bad ones. I think my, my question is this, is do you think that this very discussion, because like my husband has two-factor encryption for everything, and I don't have any encryption because I don't put anything on my phone. Do you think that this discussion of this actually kind of harms our expectation of privacy because that's the word as a lawyer I kind of the phrase I get into I worry that we keep saying well is it okay because this nice lady was saying you know oh but I'd be upset with the next circumstances argument I don't think there's any argument that trumps our privacy and I want to know your thoughts on just the basic privacy argument that we're getting into this tech world about but where where does the privacy argument go in a broader scope. 
I think there's something that we haven't been touched on at all that's important to note, which is that when you have a backdoor in encryption or a backdoor in technology, it can be used on everyone at once in kind of a mass panopticon scale, scale without anyone knowing it happened, unlike, for example, your ability to pick locks or break doors. Uh, and, and that's something that um, makes it much scarier than, than a lot of the other kinds of things that the government tries to use when people learn about you. Anyone else? Well, and, and I would just add to that, yeah. Uh, at its core, I've been here more years than I care to think about. And, and it seems like every year there's some panel where I'm encouraging everyone to take some responsibility for their own security and privacy because it, your, your ultimate privacy is my greatest concern. And it seems like more and more we're giving it away to whoever wants it, whether it's, whether it's Google or Facebook or the government or whoever. And I think that that is, is, is where our greatest risk comes in, is that we're all, we, we've all, I think, accepted this idea that it's just not, there's just no privacy anymore. Or we think there's privacy and don't do anything about it. And, and that's where I can't not stress enough that we ought to be involved in our own privacy. Okay, let's, let's jump back one question about what we do to, to be involved. Okay, all of that is great, and I'm never going to tell anyone to not contact their, their representative or, or, or their government, but you don't, you don't need to come be a lawyer, you don't need to come be a policymaker, you don't need to be a lobbyist. You need to sit down and tell your friends, hey, maybe you should do this a little more carefully next time. Hey, maybe we should change out our default text messages. Hey, maybe we should read those things before we click yes on the terms and conditions. You know, that the, the, the small changes are just as big as the big changes. Now, making policy, that, that's, that's important. That, that's something we all need to be involved in. But making the government do things doesn't necessarily solve the problem if we're going to sit home and be stupid. So you've got to not be stupid. Okay? Go, go take some steps for your own personal involvement in this as well. We have one last really quick question. Okay, I'm, I'm curious about when you talked about the um, government wanting to put this malware backdoor into everything. And I want to know if all of the thumbs that, that are being issued to government workers right now, the FBI, uh, the D diplomatic corps, the security people, the White House, do they have backdoors? Do they have malware on their phones? So this is a really interesting question, just a real quick point, uh, two quick points. One is that in Colombia right now, it's actually illegal to use encryption unless you're a high-level government employee and then they have to offer you encryption. It's a very interesting double standard. BlackBerry also does a double standard because they have given their whole encryption key to very specific governments, like the Indian government has BlackBerry's encryption key, but if you're an enterprise user and you pay extra, like governments do, they don't give over those keys. So every BlackBerry customer who is not an enterprise user, the Indian government, I believe also the Canadian government, has your encryption key to access your whole phone. But if you're an enterprise user, they don't. It's double standards. And uh, just to quickly add to that, uh, the government loves to surveil on people. The government loves surveilling on their own more. Uh, and that's because you can tell who's a turned agent, who could possibly be a turned agent, things like that. That's why some people within government positions get their taxes audited every single year, stuff like that. But someone outside the government could be breaking into the White House or, or the military or, you know, the accident could be at risk by that. Oh yes, most definitely. All right, well, thank you all for coming. Thank our panelists. Thank <laughs> you.